well okay so you set up this scheme um, and you didn't just take 10% off the top you took the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> you know you didn't even you, there was no you, you were clearly intending on stealing all of this money and that I find that incredible when I come across those examples Catherine Old Partners presents The Cut podcast about all things insolvency. Well, hello, everyone. This is the next episode of The Cut. Uh, my name's Simon Cathro from Cathro and Partners, and we've got a, a very special guest, a, a, a long colleague, a colleague of mine that lives a long, long way away from Australia, Angela Barkhouse. She is a the managing partner and principal in um, Cayman Islands and British Virgin Islands. So, um, how are you, uh, Angela? Nice to uh, nice. To, thank you for joining us tonight. And um, hope uh, I know it's quite late there and at the moment. But uh, th thanks for coming on, on to the show. It's a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. I. Um, yeah, this episode and, and what we cover off in the cut is to, is to really get a better understanding of some of the things that happen both locally in Australia and then, then globally and seeing what kind of um, markets that we are and things that we get exposed to. And um, I suppose to start that off, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to um, uh, tell us a bit about your background and, and the history of when you st and how your career started and how you got to where you are now in Quantuma. Okay, um, so sort of working backwards, I suppose my uh, I am the as you say the I'm the regional head and the managing partner for uh, Cayman Islands and um, British Virgin Islands, which is in the Caribbean, um, and I uh, lead the cross border asset recovery group. So primarily, my interests and my ex expertise lies within asset recovery, financial investigations, and data analysis. So, so that's where sort of I, I kind of position myself. Um, I'm also a insolvency practitioner, but I use insolvency as a as a mechanism for asset recovery and for investigations, and and to be able to obtain evidence and, and information throughout the investigations as well. So, um, so that's sort of what I do. Um, I joined Quantuma uh, in January 2021, uh, and that was after the acquisition of a company that I, I started up in in the Cayman Islands called Alchemy, uh, which was the same thing. So very much focused on the asset recovery and financial investment investigations piece sort of over in this part of the world, but also kind of stretching across and touching into sort of many, many jurisdictions, uh, mainly common law jurisdictions where there was money flows that it had gone through. Um, I became interested in forensic accounting. I, I started off actually as a, as a senior management accountant for um, BDO, uh, so it's top six firm in the UK. Um, I always had an interest in sort of corruption and fraud and um, and that kind of kind of interesting investigation side of the of the piece, um, and had worked with BDO for some time when um, they had decided to move the finance department out of London into a different sort of region of in London, um, and I wasn't sort of able or keen really to kind of go to to where they were repositioning the offices for the finance team and they essentially offered me a chance to go anywhere I would like sort of within within BDO and it gave me a really good opportunity to sort of move into the forensic investigation um, sphere so that's what I decided to do so that was sort of around 2008 so I got into forensic investigation and within BDO there was an asset recovery department and then I went into the asset recovery department and had some really really good cases and a, a great time kind of dealing with asset recovery mainly for uh, law enforcement agencies actually so worked closely with what was then the serious organized crime agency um, where there was sort of drug traffickers and um, wrongdoers that had assets and then our job was to act as receivers, obtain those assets on behalf of the state and uh, preserve them um, and then liquidate them and, and so that they could be recovered for the state. Um, and then that sort of pro progressed into um, working for Grant Thornton. Uh, where I joined their uh, fraud, it's a fraud insolvency division, 
um, and worked with them for for quite a number of years. Um, and that was where I kind of cut my first, um, well, cut my teeth on my first corruption case. So, and that was with the government of the Maldives, and that was investigating the former president of um, the Maldives. And it was a it was a fantastic case where we were looking at sort of what had happened over the previous thirty years of autocratic rule, and deciding sort of whether or not there were investigations or, or um, asset recovery that could take place sort of for the Maldives government because uh, it was the first democratically elected government in 30 years. Uh, we did some work with them. Um, that sort of changed. Um, we were disengaged actually when there was a coup, so the opposite side came in and we were disengaged very, very quickly. Um, but that was the sort of the first full sort of fraud and corruption case. And, and I ended up moving into Kroll after that and then ended up doing a lot of investigations in lots of different jurisdictions which had a fraud and corruption aspect to it. Um, but I had the opportunity to move offshore in 2017, which I did, and that that first went into the British Virgin Islands. Um, and that was great because you really got a chance to see how the money flows were working sort of like within, so working within the corporate context within those those jurisdictions. Uh, the BVI was always seen as a bit of a black hole and certainly that was explained to me as such. Um, when there's uh, um, any monies that had kind of gone through the BVI, they felt that it was too difficult or as I was told, um, it was put in the too difficult box to be able to recover from. Um, and actually, you know, the courts there are very well versed in being able to assist um, victims of fraud and, and creditors and using the insolvency tool was a really good way being able to do that so um, unfortunately I was only in the British Virgin Islands for around six months um, because Hurricane Irma which was a Cat 5 hurricane swept through uh, I was uh, evacuated over to the Cayman Islands um, and then I've stayed here ever since and that was in 2017 so we're now coming up to six years being in the Cayman Islands um, and working essentially on as I say financial investigations and asset recovery. Wow, that's a uh, that's a great little career there. And I, I suppose what's interesting is the kind of matters you get over in British Virgin Islands and Caymans are really large and interesting and has some, some real uniqueness to it sometimes. And I mean, if there was one sort of particular case that sort of stood out for you, what would that have been and sort of what happened on that matter? Um, well, I mean, interestingly, I'm, 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 Two of my most interesting cases that I'm currently pointed on, which I unfortunately can't give too many details on, but I would say they are my most interesting cases. Um, so I, I am appointed on 1MDB, which is the global asset recovery efforts for the fraud that was perpetrated on the Malaysian government. And that was around 7.65 billion that was stolen. Um, and we are working on that and that's incredible. We are working across many, many jurisdictions and, and it's, you know, understanding the money flows is, 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 has been just, just amazing. Um, and that I'm also appointed on Emergent Fidelity Technologies Limited, which is the company which Sam Bankman Freed um, purchased the Robinhood shares in the US, which is worth around 700 million. Um, and that was as part of the FTX fallout sort of in November of last year. So I've been appointed on those, those, those two cases. Um, and so, as I said, you know, they're current cases, so I can't go into too many, too many details, but they are, both of them are extremely fascinating and, and throwing up very, very interesting aspects to financial investigation and asset recovery. Yeah, so let's just start, start to talk about sort of techniques that you use. So you talk about the the money tracing uh, or the tracing of monies, I suppose. Like what are the some of the techniques and or systems or, or, or approaches you use to, to, to try and, um, I suppose, create the evidence or locate the evidence? I think it comes back to using uh, legal remedies as most uh, well, as best as you can. Um, so you're obtaining the evidence and quite frankly, it's good old fashioned um, tracing of fund flows. Um, you know, and it changes nowadays because there's a lot of crypto that we're dealing with, as I said, with, in relation to sort of FTX and another crypto case I'm on. But, but it is about tracing good old fund flows. So it's receiving sort of the, the, the banking records and the data and getting into the shoes of the company and obtaining uh, information such as corporate services, um, information and records, books and records, and really kind of understanding what had happened through the process. Um, you know, I, I don't think for me personally, there's, there's too much um, magic to it other than being able to really kind of being intuitive around what you're seeing. Um, I do think that as, a, as an investigator, financial investigator, it can be a very intuitive process. It could be looking at the records as they come in and then seeing that there's, there's something that doesn't quite look right or 
Um, there's a feeling that something was treated in a different way in the, in, the, in the accounts and the books and records than it should have been. And then being able to kind of dig into that a little bit more. Uh, we do use tools, you know, um, financial investigation tools. We use Altia to be able to like convert, you know, uh, bank statements into readable um, terms. We use um, Reveal, which is our um, e-discovery platform, and that utilizes an um, AI to be able to dig into um, documents and key search terms and then find new areas to maybe look at and, and maybe consider in terms of the investigation. So I wouldn't say there's too much to it other than just being, you know, a good old investigator and being able to really understand what it is you're looking at. Um, and and, and that's, that's, what, that's, that's where I think it sits. Yeah, okay. You mentioned the use of insolvency processes to, to, to achieve some of this. Do you want to just elaborate a bit on that and sort of, um, I, I suppose for some of our viewers, that some of them have got insolvency backgrounds, but um, yeah, what, what, what's, is it a liquidation? Is it something co called something else? I know in Singapore, in Luke's team, they've got the judicial management um, um, option. We've got voluntary administration here. What, what, what's the sort of the um, process you use for, for your work? Um, well, I think the beauty of using insolvency as a tool for asset recovery, and it is just one uh, tool in the, in, the, in the armory, so to speak, but it is the ability to use the court to assist you to be able to obtain and find evidence. Um, so you step into the shoes of the company, you are appointed into the company by the court. Um, often I've been appointed on what we call a just and equitable, ba equitable basis, and it is a liquidation, as, as you say, we don't have judicial management here, um, but it's, a, it's, it's appointed into that company on a just and equitable basis, which is normally where the company has lost its substratum because there are the directors or the owners have fled or absconded, which has happened in, in a few cases I've been involved in. Or the creditors or the investors have said that, you know, they, they're not quite sure what's happening. They've not been able to redeem their investments or there's some wrongdoing that's alleged or there could even be a shareholder dispute. And you're appointed into the, to the company by the court. And we kind of, we, we refer to it sometimes as the superpowers that a liquidator has. Um, you know, you can imagine that we put on our special paper and we go in and we're saying, right, this is the stuff that we can get out of the company that quite frankly, outsiders cannot get and they can't get it in a very quick fashion. And quite often it's things like going into a corporate services agent or a registered agent and asking them for the KYC documents, the account opening documents, etc. cetera. Um, who actually owned this company? You know, it's, it might be hidden in behind a, a, uh, what they call a shell company or a company that's incorporated in some of these jurisdictions where um, ultimate beneficial ownership is not disclosed in the public register. But we can obtain that information and we can see who actually controlled the company and who owned the company. And then we can go to the banks themselves and say, we have a contractual right for, for you to send us the financial records and the banking transactions so we can see what's happened. We have the ability to go to third parties and service providers and ask them to provide us information as to what services were provided. And all of that, you know, builds a picture of what's happened within the company. Company. And then when you've got that information, you can then go and take that information and you can um, bring claims against individuals if you're at that stage already. So you can bring a claim against a director for you know, fraudulent trading or breach of fiduciary duty if they've done something that they shouldn't have been doing. Um, but you can also take that into other jurisdictions as well. So you can ask the court to assist you and say, look, you know, there's something that's happened in, you know, country Y. Um, can we please go and get recognised over there? And the beauty of the model law is that you can go and get recognised in another jurisdiction and then seek information from service providers or banks or or third parties in that jurisdiction as well. So you, you're able to build up a picture as you go through the process that I think in terms of time frame, I just don't think you could get that as quickly as you could in maybe just a civil straightforward um, uh, process. Um, I also think it's, um, you, know, you can see I'm quite passionate about it, but it's also quite cost effective as well because sometimes you know, litigants or, or people who have been affected by wrongdoing, they will seek to go and get information from, you know, third parties and it will be via a disclosure remedy through the courts as well. But every time you get that information, it might not necessarily be what you were looking for and then you have to kind of start again and then pay the, 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 for the legal fees to continue that process again when actually, as the liquidator, it's part of the estate, it's part of what we do. So we're able to get that information from those registered agents because it's contractually obliged to give it 
to us without having to go back go to the court and seek an NPO or a Norwich Pharmacal, for example, to get that information. So I think, you know, it's not just time frame, it's, it's the um, ability to investigate, it's the ability to take um, the liquidation into other jurisdictions to get recognised and obtain more information, and it's, um, and it's, it's, it's cost as well. Yeah. The, um, it seems to me that the frequency of this, these kind of matters that you work on is, is a lot more frequent in, in, the, in the Cayman Islands and British Virgin Islands than it is in other regions. Is, is, is that, am I correct in that assessment or is it, is it just that um, I just know too many people in the Cayman Islands that happen to work on this stuff or... I think um, I don't think it's it. I don't think it's as uh, prevalent as people think. Um, you know, there are uh, the Cayman Islands and the Bishop Virgin Islands. They have, um, you know, a lot of funds, for example, that are incorporated here that are um, are doing really, really great things. Um, we have the Enterprise Zone in Cayman where they have lots of crypto and blockchain companies sort of incorporated and set up here. Um, I think it's just that there is definitely a perception um, that the BVI and the Cayman Islands have received a significant amount of illicit proceeds. But quite frankly, you could say that about the UK, you could say that about Switzerland, yeah. you could say that about so many other jurisdictions. And I just don't think it's, it's more so here than it is anywhere else. I think you have, unfortunately, you see these these uh, countries named in in films, and it kind of sticks into people's minds that that's where the wrongdoing must happen. Um, but actually, you know, quite a lot of the quite quite a lot of the wrongdoing happens elsewhere. It's just that sometimes, you know, we happen to have a company that's incorporated here in the courts, as I say, are very well versed um, in assisting um, victims of fraud or creditors to be able to recover their assets. So, so the the when you get a job, what, where does it often come from? Does it come from a government? Does it come from a lawyer? Does it come from a, a court decision or a court order? What, where, where's your sort of source of work coming from? Uh, most of the time it comes from sort of uh, law firms that are what I say I call onshore. Um, so essentially kind of UK, US, um, Hong Kong, um, Singapore, et cetera, where uh, they have had clients that have been affected by some kind of wrongdoing. And so they're seeking some understanding or legal recourse to be able to recover um, what monies they've, they've lost. Um, we uh, have been appointed by the court on um, the application of regulators previously, where companies may have seen to have been breaching their regulatory duties, and they believe that there's some wrongdoing that may have taken place. And so in the public interest, Interest, the regulator will ask to, to have someone appointed. So that's that's happened in the past as well. And, and yes, I do, and I have worked for um, governments as well. And that's that's very, very different because normally it's through a, a process where you have to go through a tender process or you have to, you know, meet and present what your expertise and your, your background is. Um, but that normally comes through um, sort of word of mouth or recommendations where they ask you to come and see them because they've seen the kind of work that we've done previously. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned earlier about a lot of um, uh, maybe international operations having a BVI entity in their uh, structure, and, and that's that, that's that's certain certainly something I've seen. And I don't really fully understand the purpose of why a, a group, a large corporation, would have a BVI entity. Is there, is there something you can elaborate on that in terms of the the reasoning why some of these businesses do set up BVI entities? Um, I think a lot of them do that because of the ease of being able to um, set up a business. Um, there's obviously the advantage of it being um, neutral tax uh, jurisdiction. Um, there are cases, of course, where people do want to take advantage of what we call um, having not, well, not needing to disclose the ultimate beneficial owner for various different reasons. Um, I mean, there can be a number of reasons why someone would set up or, or an entity would set up um, what we say off sure um, and normally it's for operational reasons and and trying to maybe um, coordinate so they have a holding company in the BVI and Cayman and then the subsidiaries and the operations may be elsewhere then it feeds into the the fact that it's a tax neutral jurisdiction um, that's that's you know happening less I think um, you know now that we have this kind of in, it focus on global tax and you know the global tax you know minimum yeah. amount that they, they're trying to put forward and whether that will change things I don't know um, but I 
for the main part, I think it's more to do with operations and cost efficiencies and and just making it easier for, for, for the owners themselves. So do you see a trend in, do you have cycles, like in insolvency, we have cycles where we'll have yeah, obviously when a recession hits, um, the work picks up quite significantly in our industry. Do you see any trends in the work you do or is it just happens when it happens? Um, for, for, for the fraud and investigation side of things, it happens when it happens for the most part. Um, however, there is definitely a, I would say, a, 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 it follows a similar cycle to the insolvency cycle because quite often what happens is, is that um, there will be allegations of wrongdoing or not being able to redeem my investments when there is more difficulty in the market. Um, and it might not be wrongdoing. It might just be that, you know, the company itself is struggling a little bit financially um, and it's unable to repay its debts. And therefore, you've got the pure insolvency restructuring process, which we, we, we have a very, very strong um, regime here. But, um, but in terms of the investigation side of it, that does normally follow, follow that. Uh, cycle um, and it's just because at that point in time the wrongdoers may find it more difficult to you know if it's the Ponzi scheme for example to pay the former investors because new investors are less likely to invest into something because everyone's looking after their pennies now and they want to make sure that there's other things that they're, they're preserving their assets as they are so yeah there is there is a follow-on to that so we do follow the insolvency cycle but in general terms it can be fairly consistent as well particularly if you're dealing with government asset recovery that can be a fairly consistent um, life cycle I, I often find in some of the insolvency work I do, um, there'll be, a, you know, the, you'll get a, all sorts of different types of uh, corporate failures, but the ones where there's some, um, um, you know, some fraud or some sort of um, breach of director duty for, for the use of monies that should otherwise have been used for the company, not for themselves, um, <coughs> it tends to to flow with the economic cycle. So the more insolvency work that yeah. happens, the more of this kind of behavior tends to get exposed. And I often wonder that when things are good, it's probably still happening, but it's just, mm -hmm. it seems to get saved by the economic activity and the health of the company or the, uh, the ease of capital raising. I, I mean, do you, do you have a view on that? Um, definitely. I mean, a really good example is the pandemic, um, actually, because there was there was a time during that where I think, you know, um, companies and directors were struggling, um, but they were being bailed out by these economic policies and fiscal programs. And and they were being, it was effectively being hidden. <laughs> the wrongdoing, well, not I would say the wrongdoing, but the, the financial um, issues were, were being hidden effectively. And then sort of once all of that was taken away, all of a sudden you're now really seeing the insolvencies increasing now. And, um, and it's, it's, it's just coming to the front now. It's just, it was always there. It's just that now we're starting to see the evidence of it because there's nothing to hide behind anymore. You can't hide behind those, those policies. Yeah. One of the um, experiences that I've had with our local regulator is when we, you know, we're, our role as a liquidator is to, to convert to cash. It's the civil element of, of the investigation and the criminal element is run by the regulated Australian, you know, Australian Securities Investment Commission. But when they issue um, various notices on us to access the records or get copies of certain transactions or something, they're very careful in the way they do it, um, firstly, in the way they issue the notice, and secondly, in the way of what they disclose to us. In fact, they don't disclose to, to us that much at all. And, and the reasoning that they've said to us is that it, it, it's very important that the evidentiary process around these investigations is protected. And is that a sort of similar thing over in, in, in your region around that sort of you know, you, you mentioned right at the beginning, uh, the, the, you know, I can't talk too much about the current matters because of, you know, confidentiality and, and the investigation. So is that a similar thing about the protection of the evidence to, to ensure that it doesn't get, I suppose, um, tainted? Um, my experience has been it's not necessarily about tainting the evidence. Um, I think that my experience has been more that the law enforcement agencies in the different jurisdictions that I have been dealing with have been investigating certain things for, for a long period of time. Um, 
and they and they they have proceedings in place and so what they're asking you to do is effectively just hold on because we have this proceeding in place and so you can only deal with your issue until our proceedings have concluded um and i i, I think that I've, I've experienced that a lot um you know it's an in a lot of cases, including crypto cases. So um, that that is something that we are seeing. Um, it's not necessarily that the evidence needs to be protected because they can obtain the evidence in sometimes quicker, sometimes much slower um, than we can. Uh, there have been examples where we've been able to obtain information using insolvency in different jurisdictions much quicker than the law enforcement agency has been able to do through government to government uh, mutual legal assistance request. Um, but the point is, is that they, they need to be able to get through their investigation and their burden of proof obviously is much higher than ours and so it takes a lot longer for them to be able to put the evidence together whereas in we're just really dealing on the financial issues and, and looking at a civil uh, recovery process and which doesn't include you know a, a prison term or anything like that so um so it's more to do with that i think than it's i've certainly never come across any any law enforcement agency or regulator saying to us it's about the evidence and potentially affecting that evidence in any way it's just a case of you have to stay your proceedings whilst you know they're continuing theirs yeah that's it and, and that sort of that does sort of apply here in our area i mean we we are not deal, delving into the kind of stuff that you're talking about so so for me i i've got um it's hard for me to compare because it's probably a different type of investigation that I do on, on this stuff but we do often in our conversations talk about timelines and the timing of certain things um, so just to just to sort of pivot a little bit into you're clearly passionate about what you do and 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 and, and the work you do and you must have some incredible stories a lot of which you'd love to tell people mm. <laughs> but you can't but um, you know for, for someone that sort of wants to get into that space that you do what's sort of the the bit that what well, what what's the most in, what, what would you say to someone around you know if you were to have a career in in, in the forensic and the fraud investigations um yeah i mean i absolutely love my job i think i've got the best job in the world um and it's it's the passion for um doing the right thing and getting the right result that I think personally sort of drives me forward. And I know that with, within my team, it's very much the same thing. It's really kind of digging into things and finding stuff that maybe nobody else has found before. And yeah. then using that in a way that you know that it's giving the right result for, and for the, you know, whether it's victims of fraud and whether it's a dispute and you know that there has been some wrongdoing that's taken place, it gives huge satisfaction. Um, it is a difficult industry to get into. I would say that I've experienced it myself when I first started. As I said, I always had an interest in investigations and fraud and corruption. And I was extremely lucky to have ended up in a position where I could have moved into forensic investigations. But I had sought um, to apply, or I had applied for forensic investigator roles prior to that. And it's a really difficult um, industry to get into. But I do think that, um, you know, nowadays it's, it's not just, um, and certainly that for me, it's it's not necessarily having the standard background, um, which used to be the case. You used to have to go through audit and you have to go through the process, etc. It really is demonstrating what you can bring in terms of your intuition into these cases um yeah. you know when, when, and also you're in, interesting you know what's going on in the world as well so you know what's going on in, with this particular case over in the us what's going on with that particular case in the uk and, and the legal remedies that come with that and i do find sometimes you have to be a part lawyer as well in these cases but you know it's really it's really just the passion for it i think is is key more than anything else I think you also probably got to think like a criminal mind too, because you have to sort of say, what, what, what would I do if I was to try and defraud someone or, or do something? And, and does that kind of thinking come into your thought process? Um, it doesn't, but there have been there have been definitely things that we've come across and we've gone, we've looked at it and gone, wow, okay, now I can yeah. absolutely understand why they did that. Um, 
or why they may have used that jurisdiction. You know, there, for example, that we, we, we discovered fairly recently that, um, you know, one jurisdiction, the, co the corporate re records were only ever held for five years. And so it's really difficult if it's been longer than five years to be able to obtain that information um, and, and be able to restore a company particularly and then, you know, be able to investigate it. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, I think it's, it's really, um, People have said to me, you know, have you ever considered going to the dark side? <laughs> I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> Clearly not. But um, but it is incredible sometimes when you kind of work through the process and kind of, and you go, oh, yeah, no, I, I understand. I could, I could completely see why that happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I love what I do too, and I've always got great stories, but I'm allowed to talk about it because it's civil. It's not, you know, the, the confidentiality is there, yeah. but certain... Um, there is definitely, you know, we, we, we get a lot of media, I suppose, on many matters that often tell the story, but um, it just, um, the, the, some of the, uh, I suppose some of the stuff I see are just ex extraordinarily dumb and, 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 and some, look, sometimes desperate, unfortunately, which, which is, is a little bit harder to deal with because there's, there's, there's a genuine reason for doing it. But I suppose for you, what... Uh, something that I suppose you could talk about, well, what's the dumbest thing you've ever seen by someone in terms of committing a fraud? Um, <laughs> um, I think, uh, I mean, sometimes I think it's really dumb when they try and put things into their spouse's names. It's, it's as if we, we didn't think we wouldn't know. <laughs> it's, yeah. um, it's a really obvious move. <laughs> um, or trying to put it into the name of a proxy or, or something like that. Um, I think those are the really obvious ones for me. Um, you know, yeah, just because you put it into your wife's name or your husband's name, really. Yeah, it, <laughs> right, I think... Um, I think the thing is that, that when I see this kind of behaviour, it baffles me sometimes to think, how did you not think you weren't going to get caught doing it? Like, yeah, I know, exactly, yeah. Because yeah. It's, it, it, you've got people around you, good people, that are, that are not prepared to, to be an accessory to your crime or to the fraud, and, and they, just, they just blatantly go ahead and do it and think that they're almost immune to getting caught. And that's the bit that really baffles me, is that you sit here and you look at these jobs, and I certainly don't have the kind of, uh, um, you know, events or situations that you looked at, but I've got some. And, and you just scratch your head and you go, how yeah. did you not think that we weren't going to pick that up or, or, or your, your CFO or your, 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 your legal counsel or someone in the business was not going to, to do something about it? Like it's, it's blatantly criminal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I always find it amazing when I come across um, fraud where they sort of incorporated, they, they came up with the idea of what they were going to do. And, you know, we're talking sort of genuine fraudsters. And, um, and, and you think, well, okay, so you set up this scheme um, and you didn't just take 10% off the top. You took the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you didn't even, you, there was no, you, you were clearly intending on stealing all of this money. And that, I find that incredible when I come across those um, examples. It's not yeah. just, you know, I'm taking in, I mean, a little bit here and a little bit there. Um, and I think sometimes also I'm always astounded by the amount of money that, that fraudsters will take. You know, I, it's, I always think, well, why couldn't you have just survived with 10 million, I don't know, or something. But no, they want to take 500 million. <laughs> yeah. million. I think um, it, it, yeah. it almost becomes an addiction. Like, they're, yeah. like it's, they're, there is no limit. It's, it's, I'll just keep going until I get caught. Yes. Yeah, um, and it's sort of almost a, fam a form of gambling. Almost is that mm. it's um, you see with gamblers, and we, we often have um, companies that fail because of a, someone's got a gambling problem. And um, yeah, particularly in New South Wales, there's a huge um, uh, amount of uh, gambling that's available. So casinos, ga poker machines, uh, horse racing, whatever. But um, they they just they'll just keep going until they get caught, and, right. or they run out of money, and you know. It's just amazing. Yeah, yeah, incredible, yeah. But um, look, uh, just to sort of wrap it up, I think, um, uh, and thank you for, for joining the, 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 the Cut episode. It's, it's been fantastic. It's fascinating stories there. Um, any views in the next 12 months on what the market might be around your region? Uh, well, I, I definitely see it picking up, um, and I think that is because of the economic outlook at the moment. Um, but it's not just, you know, the fraud sort of investigations. It's also 
shareholder disputes as well that it's coming into play. Um, yeah. But we, we are definitely seeing things pick up here um, quite a bit. Um, and I don't expect that to slow down at all over the yeah, next few yeah. months. And that seems to be consistent across, across all the regions that I've interviewed in the UK, Singapore, and, and certainly here in Australia. Um, although Australia seems to be, we, we've got, um, we, we're starting to see across the whole country uh, a pick up in insolvency, but um, certain regions like Western Australia, which is heavily uh, reliant on mining, is, is still doing very well. So, um, and plus, but, but uh, yeah, the market is definitely picked up. But look, Angela, thank you, and thank you for, for taking the time out um, to, to, to be interviewed and, and to join the podcast. Um, again, for anyone that is watching, um, Angela's got a great background in what she specialises in, uh, can help out, and anyone that has um, uh, businesses, companies, assets in, in, in the, the British Virgin Islands or Cayman Islands, um, she, uh, Angela can certainly help out. And look, thank you for joining the episode tonight. And um, and look, I'll let you get back to bed. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Catherine Partners, The Cut. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode. For more insights, please visit our website, catherinepartners.com.au or find us on LinkedIn.